Now, any other good use cases for HTML5 local storage that you've seen out there? Well, I can only really speak to the, the specific need that I had, but certainly anytime you're persisting preferences for the user, oh. um, as long as you're comfortable with them being per browser, you know, then yeah, lay them down as, uh, you can lay up to like, I think five megabytes, a really large number. So you can have a really extensive local cache of stuff stored on the user's local browser for speed reasons, right? Isn't this yep. what Google Gears was all about? It's exactly. about improving the experience for the user. I mean, that's the right mindset to have. Is like, how can we make things better for the user, not how can we serve our nefarious ad network? <laughs> uh, and that's certainly the, the goal we had. We just want to use it to, to make the experience better on our websites. It's, it's just very selfish, really. I want to. I got a couple other questions about the session, but it, it sometimes it's funny to hear you uh, talk. Cause do you, do you ever feel conflicted about running an ad network and some of the things that happen in an ad network? Uh, no, okay. because you know again we respond we advertise responsibly. We have certain policies that we set, like we don't take animated ads. We're not going to show too many ads. It's a certain amount of advertising is, is pretty much expected, I think, in this as part of the internet. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And it's, it's our job, one of our goals. Joel sent this email out that was a little ridiculous in my opinion, but he's like, we, we want 1% click through. Like, we want ads that are so relevant that, you know, they're, they're just awesome ads. They're mm -hmm. really relevant to the users. That is our goal. It's like, we want to show you stuff that you would want to see anyway, hopefully. Yes. Now, there's certain part of the audience, like, you know what, ads are evil, everything's evil. But, I mean, if you're rational, you're willing to work with us, we only want to show you ads that are good and relevant. Um, and I think Joel's attitude of 1% click-through is insane. That's, that's, that's off the charts. That's the thing, I'm only going to date supermodels. But I want to be clear that even Joel, the, the high levels of the company, is like, hey, we're only going to date supermodels. We're only going to have the best advertising policies imaginable. Um, so I, I think that's the goal, as long as we're clear about that. And certainly, I think if you go to our sites, I think it's, it's not an offensive experience, even as an anonymous user. And as, uh, as you get reputation, you know, we suppress ads. As a, as a courtesy, like if you're on our site all the time, hey, we'll turn off some ads because you're on our site all the time anyway. Let us thank you for being on our site by not showing you as many ads. You know, what, who I, else does that? I mean, that's not that common. I mean, you can buy subscriptions, but we don't charge you. We're just like, okay, learn some reputation. Let us start to trust you. And you're like, hey, cool, we'll turn off some ads for you. Yes, yes. I, I forgot where I heard this, but there was an interesting conversation about, I think, uh, was it Metafilter or somebody does that as well? But the question becomes, uh, There's a couple sites that do it. It's not super uncommon. Right, but you know, how would the advertisers feel about you know top users are the ones who are not seeing the ads? Well, we still have the, the main ad slots are still there. Like, okay. and, and we've actually had, <coughs> excuse me, we've had ad campaigns that targeted um, in a good way. They would give high rep users free stuff, and they love this. Oh my God, this is great! And in fact, you guys should do this because I'm telling you, they love that. They were like, "Wow, this is awesome." We we do. So we're in the sort of 10k rep type of giveaway. Yes. Yes, that's a very very effective. They love that. Gosh, yeah. that really works. And that's an example of you know, it's giving you a benefit. It's like, hey, you have to look at all this rep. Awesome. Here's a little purchase for you. So it's cool. They, when, by the way, let me understand. It's a ex fantastic experience, even better on Coding Horror because there's like one thing down there. Right. Now, um, any any concern about the other HTML features? For example, you know, I, I, we're hearing different things about XHTML being sort of not being worked on. Yes. Yeah. XHTML was just kind of a failed experiment. Like, I'm, I'm looking forward to HTML5 just to sort of get rid of the specter of XHTML, which I think was just very ill-conceived mm -hmm. in the way that it, it works. So yeah, I, I, and, and certainly I'm very pleased with, the, with the, the, the pieces that we're using, granted very tiny pieces, are solving a very real problem for me. So that makes me more open to, wow, the HTML5 guys are really solving actual problems. They're not just, you know, coming up committees with who knows what. They're actually thinking about us developers out here, like having these problems that we have and solving them. So that's very encouraging. I was much more willing to look at it once I sort of found that. Now, you're a big fan of, you know, getting on the web because that, that is the future, you know. Um, but what about mobile? What is your take on mobile? You know, should people be concerned about having a mobile version of their site because you know, iPhones are selling iPads and Androids? And well, it was interesting with the the iPhone. What really sold me on the iPhone was when we were building Stack Overflow in two thousand eight. That was the same time, roughly, the iPhone came out uh, that year. That the iPhone actually ran our site. That was never even a goal. I was like, well, this is going to use jQuery. It's going to be fairly. You know, it's for developers, right? We're going right. to assume you have a good browser and all that stuff. And I just wrote off mobile. So I think what happened is the mobile world kind of caught up. The iPhone can do a lot of desktop-type sites. Now, you have a screen space limitation that's unavoidable. That's right. the thing, really, that you have to optimize for. But I think we're no longer in the situation where the phone browser sucks so much that you have to create, like, a totally dumbed-down version. I think it's more like, well, we just got to refit the content a little bit. Um, I'm kind of torn because, on the one hand... It splits your effort. You know, you have a site that does certain things for mobile, and you have a site that does certain things for your, you know, you kind of want one that does for all, mostly. Um, I haven't really figured out the right solution there yet. Uh, 
but I'm certainly open to the issues of content reflow, mm -hmm. so you don't have like a sidebar and like ten other elements that you have constantly scrolling. Um, that would be my focus. Is like I, I wish there was a cleaner way to handle that. W would that be part of uh, that progressive enhancement term that you used? I mean, so if you're it on mobile, it just be. It could be. I mean, part of the style sheets would get suppressed. But then, you know, it's funny because I did this on the blog. I used a uh, iPhone, Android, you know, uh, mobile theme on WordPress. Mm -hmm. And then people started complaining because the images wouldn't allow you to size them anymore. Right. So it's sort of a catch-22. It's like, it, yes, it's better on the mobile, but then it's also easier if they just have the same content as everybody else. And they just there's one set of complaints rather than two. <laughs> right. Um, but but I'm, I'm sympathetic to it. I think if you have a site where... It's just I think on Stack Overflow it's not the primary goal of site to be a mobile site, uh, but if you're you have a site where a lot of users are on mobile, I think you should refocus that uh, and, and and try something a little bit different. So we're we're trying to have a middle ground, and then also like should there be a special app? We have a whole API at StackApps.com, and people have built you know uh, iPhone apps and Android apps oh, yeah. that use our API. It's a read-only API though, so you have to be okay with that. We haven't even attempted to solve the very hard problem of how do you vet content coming from an API. Right. Kind of hard problem. So we we're not trying to solve that. So even again, you're torn. It's like, well, do I have a custom mobile you know scheme, or do I have an app that I build, or just just out of curiosity, why is that hard to uh, allow uh, to posting content? Well, if you think about what happens on Stack Overflow, we're gonna see if your content is a duplicate, mm -hmm. like when you submit the post. We're gonna try to give you a bunch of hints about like how to write it, like what is good, what is bad. Mm -hmm. None of that will be visible from an API. Right. Right. Um, that, that's probably the main concern. And then there's rate limiting issues, and there's just a bunch of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I know it looks very simple, and it is simple. It's intended to look very simple, but it's actually quite complex in terms of what we allow and how we look at your content and the heuristics we apply to it. And when you don't come in, this is just another argument of splitting effort. So rather than having all the content come in through one pipe mm -hmm. that we can apply the same rules to, now it's like, oh, we have this other pipe. It's kind of different. But it, you know, it's uh, just complicated. So, I see what you're saying. You don't want to take away the value, which is part of the UI. Yeah. The UI is helping you, trying to help you. It's trying to help us, too. Like, is it a duplicate? Should it be closed? Is the HD even be allowed? Right. Um, what tags should you use? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of ambient information that's presented on the website that would just be, how would that even be presented in, in, in an external app we can't control? Um, which I'm fine with reading, but when it comes to... One of the quickest ways to sort of ruin a Q&A system is to flood it with bad questions. Now, I'm not saying having a right API would cause that, but anything that risks that is a very, very serious risk. Now... Finally, uh, about your blog, you come up with interesting aspects. Now, you've said on your blog, you know, mm -hmm. A, you should blog, and B, come up with something interesting to say, right? So, for example, your YouTube post, right? Uh, and that's phenomenal how YouTube can check everything, right? Oh, that's but amazing. Where did you, I mean, is it just that you're just very geeked in and, you know, tuned into these uh, topics, right? I mean, wh where do some of your... Uh, angles come from for your blog I think post. there's a lot of subcultures on the internet. There's a lot of information that they're sort of the mainstream news mm -hmm. and then there's the alternative. And the wonderful thing about the internet is that it, it, I used to joke that it was like moving to California because in California whatever weird thing you're into there's somebody else that's into that. And the internet is like that. The internet is like everything is California. No matter how weird your interests are, good or bad um, there's a bunch of, there's probably a whole community for that, right? Right. And those are not mainstream communities. So what I like to do is I like to dip my toes in those communities. Like, wow, this is really interesting. You know, again, it's like you're always learning, right? It's like, I want to learn about this community. I want to see what makes them tick. Like, for example, I got into flying kites just briefly, and I was like, wow, there's a whole community of people that are hardcore kite people. Yeah. And I was learning and, like, seeing what they were doing. And then there's a whole YouTube culture of, you know, submitting content to YouTube and how things get presented on YouTube and sort of the teenagers that use YouTube. And there's a whole, like pyramid schemes. There's a whole subculture there as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really look at it and you really think, you know, dig in, um, and I think that's just, to me, that's just, that's how I am. It's like I, I look at these little subcultures and I get sucked in. I'm like, right. wow, this is really interesting. You know, and I, I go into their little subculture and I look around and it's like, wow, I've entered this, this room I've never seen before with all these really interesting people. And I can't live here because I don't have time to, but I'm going to make some observations. And I think you've got to spend some time outside the mainstream, I think. I mean, just in, in very broad general strokes. I think that's where a lot of these interesting topics come from is on the fringes of, of news, on the fringes of, I don't want to say society because that sounds too traumatic, but just, just look outside the mainstream and see what people are doing in these little these, these subcultures. And, and a lot of what we do on Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow of trying to launch new sites is trying to identify these, these subcultures and say, hey, we love communities that, that are so fanatical about kites. I think that's amazing. I think that's wonderful that people are able to pursue their interests and come up with these really uh, you know, fascinating bits of information about this, this, this topic. They're the best people in the world to do that stuff. Um, so I'm just kind of really trying to give them their due. And on my blog, I'm just sort of surfacing some of the, the, 
the tip of the iceberg of like some of the stuff that I see out in the world. So I mean, that's very broad advice, but uh, that's I think how it works for me for the most part. And how do you how do you find these subcultures? You just start googling and you end land on these things. You're like, oh, there's this you know guy's website and he's talking about so and so. Is that generally how you just you know start into these topics? I think so. I think mostly you're you're just digging in because you have some. You're just, what is this topic about? You know, mm -hmm. who, who's into this? Why are they into this? Who would even be into this, right? Like, how crazy is this, right? <laughs> right. And you're just, I mean, part of it's just like, you know, um, rubbernecking. It's like, wow, this is interesting. It's like you're driving, wow, look at that. <laughs> That's cool, <laughs> wow. The world is full of really interesting people doing really amazing, interesting stuff. And I think if you, this is going to sound wrong, but I will say it. If you can't come up with at least one interesting thing to talk about every day, you're just not trying hard enough. The world is full of just so much fascinating stuff. Um, and that, that's really how you have to think about it, you know, it's like the burden is on you to figure this stuff out because the world is, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Now, uh, finally, um, I had a last question. It's, I'm drawing a blank, so give me a sec. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know what, we'll just wrap it up. Okay. You have a lot of other properties besides uh, Stack Over, I'm sorry, besides Coding Horror, right? So I know you've got some Guitar Hero stuff. A little bit. I don't talk about that too much. But yeah, I haven't had time to maintain that. <laughs> but it's at uh, fakeplasticrock.com. I love, I'm very excited about Rock Band 3, which is coming out this month. Very, very excited about that. I just love music. Mm -hmm. That's another subculture that I, I find very interesting. Um, so yeah, fakeplasticrock.com. Um, that's just sort of a vanity thing, side project for me, honestly. Hey, I I'm surprised at your knowledge of like 80s and 90s hip hop. You know, there's some <laughs> there's some great stuff that you put out there, ling wise. I do love music. Music's good stuff. So awesome. Now, where else can people find you besides fake plastic rock, codinghorror.com? Uh, of course, uh, look at all my profiles on you know any stackexchange.com network site. Of course, Stack Overflow, uh, and I, I tend to live a lot on honestly on meta.stackoverflow. That's sort of our Washington D.C. Okay. Our governmental capital, if you will. So it's a little crazy, just like the real Washington D.C. <laughs> So I will caution you, uh, but it's fun. That's where we sort of figure out, like, what are we doing? You know, we're playing this giant game of SimCity with real people, and myself included. I'm living in that city, uh, and to me, it's it's fascinating. Uh, so if if you really want to see what I do every day, then go to meta.stackoverflow.com. But but be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and is that the best way to uh, sort of reach you? Oh, if you want to reach me, just you know, use the contact uh, form on any any of the sites. Uh, but if you have specific feedback about the sites, I would present it to the community mm -hmm. more so. Well, because email is a silo. You can email me, but I get a lot of email, first of all. <laughs> yeah. And second, it's a silo. Only I will ever see it. So if you really have something interesting to say that you think is interesting in the community, please post it on, you know, meta.stackoverflow. We have per site metas. So if you're on the bicycle site that we have, mm -hmm. like, wow, this bicycle site isn't working because X, take it to meta.bicycles. Right. Uh, and if it's about the network in general, it's like, wow, I don't think uh, Stack Exchange works at all. Like, the fact that we have a bicycle site is dumb. Then take it to uh, meta.stackoverflow. That's the governmental capital. It's complicated, just like real government. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. And finally, do you need more Twitter followers? Do you want, do you want to plug Twitter? Uh, I could. Uh, <laughs> Twitter.com slash coding horror. I say some stupid things, so feel free to. Uh, very funny me. things. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Jeff. Hey, you're welcome.